of Jesus. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome again. Thank you to everybody that's here. It's uh, wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to be together. And thank you for everybody that has joined us via live stream this morning. Thanks for being a part of the Hilltop family. I was just uh, looking at the feed and we've got people from all over that are joining us. So we're so, so glad that you're here today. We are working through the letter of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, can I just encourage everybody, uh, turn in your Bibles to a letter to the, from Paul to a town in Philippi. Of course, Paul is in prison when he is writing this. He is in chains in Rome for preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And, but he is just writing to this church that he planted in the town of Philippi where he is just full of love and joy and thanksgiving regardless of the circumstances that he is in. Sometimes circumstances can define our mood, right? What's going on around us, you know, if we're going through struggles, if we're going through hardships, then it can define our attitude, but that, that doesn't happen for Paul. And so this morning, Paul says, uh, in a sense, that we need to have an attitude check. Has anybody ever told you that? Maybe when you were younger, like, you need to check your attitude. Or, uh, you know, you, you've copped an attitude. I've heard people say that before. So this morning, you know, when Paul talks about an attitude, right, remember that just the positiveness of this letter, that you, we need to have an attitude of gratitude, right? We need to be thankful for Jesus. We need to be thankful for the community. We need to have an attitude of prayer and thanksgiving. And if we have that attitude, what we see is it drives out worry. That when we are thankful, it, it, it just drives anxiety right out of our heart and out of our, out of our mind. Guard, guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer and, and thanksgiving. So, but this morning, he's going to shift a little bit. And he's going to say that we need to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. Now, that, that's a high calling, isn't it? That's what it says. Have the same mindset. Have the same attitude of Jesus. And he's specifically going to focus on humility. If we have ever needed this attitude of humility, wow, now is the time. We need to be humble people. That needs to be our attitude. I, I don't know. I, I, I've been getting more and more um, solicitations that are false over my email. And I just want to apologize to you, some of you this week, uh, maybe those of you are watching, you got a, an email from me that was not from me. And uh, so I'm getting all these calls saying, hey, I got three emails from you today about something urgent going on. Or we're helping a person out. Send me a $50 eBay card. And uh, I see a lot of heads nodding. You, you got that. I, I apologize. So, so, you know, I was hacked, right? My email was hacked. It's so, so frustrating. And then, I'm, you know, I'm getting these emails saying they're UPS packages for me. And, you know, just check in and we got to get this special package to you. Or I get a call, uh, you know, this is the IRS. If you, you know, if you don't call us back, uh, we're going to start levying your, your, can you get those too? You know, it is so frustrating. It's hard to have a joyful attitude when I'm getting those. And so, so finally I get a call and this is how I answer the phone. I, who is it? <laughs> that's my, that's my, who is this? What, what do you want? You know, what, what do you really want? And then I said, you're lying. <laughs> you know, well, it turns out it was a longtime family friend. I didn't recognize their voice. So they may not be afraid anymore. But it's just like that. That's the response. It's just so frustrating. So Paul is saying, but you need to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. Now, there is a righteous anger. Amen. Yeah. There's a time. <laughs> right. <laughs> we all identify with that. But there's also a time we have this anger where we don't act with the attitude of Jesus. Paul says, have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And he's going to start by talking about unity. And this is a time of great divide. Great divide in our nation. We are divided politically. 
We are divided racially, and we're hearing these undertones of this, right? Or at least people feel like there's this divide. And what Paul says, the church has an opportunity to shine. And the church is called to be united. Unity comes from a heart of humility. Arrogance is what divides. Arrogance is what divides people. Arrogance and pride is what divides churches. So look at your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2. I'll start in verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, talking about the church, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude or mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who being, listen, let's talk about Jesus. Being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. That that about covers it, right? Heaven, on earth, under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have the same attitude. Do you have the same attitude right now with everything that's going on? Do you have this humble attitude of Christ? We must stay united. Unity comes through humility. Divisiveness comes as a result of pride and arrogance. I I got to uh, go to the men's group this last Friday and see Butch and Tim. And at one point, Tim said, he said, I made a mistake once. I thought I was wrong. (laughs) He was just kidding, of course. But (laughs) we love you. No, you're kidding, Tim. But it reminded me of uh, (laughs) other people used to say, you know, I, I wrestled with being humble, but now I'm perfect. I used to struggle with humility. Now, now I'm perfect. And then I also thought of the Willie Nelson song. I don't know why I have so much fun singing this song. But, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, right? Each time I look in the mirror, I keep getting prettier each day. Okay, so we have in our culture today, we have a... This, this heightened problem where it is highly toxic, where there's so much arrogance and so much pride, and it manifests itself in a political argument, or it manifests itself in a racial argument, and people are dividing across all lines, economic and social and racial, And it seems to me like I don't know of a time America's been more divided. Maybe since the Civil Civil War. And, you know, I haven't been around, obviously, that long. But, man, in my life, we are a divided nation. And states are continuing to divide. divide, And counties are continuing to divide. Right? So you've got, like, uh, Orange County that's just south of us. And... Orange County, you know, they they just do away with all these restrictions, do away with all these masks. And then you've got San Diego County, right? And San Diego's opening up, but then you have Los Angeles County, right? So now 
not only are states dividing, you got the whole Florida thing and what Florida's doing and then what we're doing here. And it, it's that you've got counties and people just division happening in so many places. And it, it is fueled by a pandemic and it is fueled by social media. And Butch, you were talking about this in men's group, right? What, what people are putting on social media right now is just so toxic. There's just so much anger. And so you can see this is an issue. And here's what Paul's saying. Don't let what is happening in culture bleed into the church. Don't, don't let the anger and the divisiveness that we see all around us seep into the church because Jesus was humble and Jesus is above politics, right? Now, if you, if you say, yes, Jesus is above politics, but you are harboring anger or, or resentment or you are looking down on a brother or sister that doesn't believe politically like you believe, then we're not being consistent. You know, some of you may have seen it. I think it's like it's not about the is it the donkey and the elephant, but about the lamb, right? It's about the lamb of God. And so, I, I mean, I like that statement. So also what I've seen is that everybody's an expert now all of a sudden. And, and that comes from a place of pride and arrogance as well. Everybody's an expert on masks. And they could tell you why you should wear a mask and why you don't have, and everybody goes to their sources. If you look at, everybody gets all the research, everybody gets the, you know, it's like you're all of a sudden, you are the expert. And we also see that dividing people as well. I think everybody's an expert in politics and everybody, you know, it's just this, the nature of what we're going through. And so Jesus calls us to something higher. He calls us to the standard. He calls us to this attitude where we will become a humble people. So look again at verse 1 as it talks about imitating Christ's humility. Look at your Bibles here. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not look into your own interests, but to the interests of others. So here's what he's saying. If, if, we, if you feel united with Jesus personally as an individual, if you feel like Jesus comforts you, like Jesus loves you, if you feel like you've got the Holy Spirit in your life and you feel like you've got tenderness and compassion because of your relationship with Jesus, that needs to transfer over into your relationships in the church. That's what keeps us united. So if you have that because of what Jesus has done for you in the body of Christ, you must have that same love and that same compassion and care and concern for one another. So Paul says, united with Christ, let's have that same unity of Jesus in the body of Christ. Now, Paul is not saying we have to agree on everything. In fact, diversity in the body is a value, and that's one of the things I've always loved about Hilltop. We have people who are leaning towards democratic politically. We have people who are leaning towards Republican politically. We have independence. We have, we have that whole mix. And we are still the family of God. We still love each other. We are still to respect each other. And we are to have humility when people disagree with us, whether it's on politics or race or what's happening in the body of Christ. We have different beliefs about our Christian faith. And, and Jesus is so humble. It's that humility that, that's going to get us through this and keep us united. So this morning, can I just challenge you to have an attitude check about how you've been dealing with politics, how you've been dealing with masks, how you've been dealing with differences on race, 
and everything that's going on all around us. Can, can, can you have an attitude check this morning and realize that Jesus Christ and His love and how we treat one another and how we talk one another, Paul says, must be above what's happening in our culture. It is a counter-cultural message to be humble, to not have selfish ambition, to not have vain conceit. It's just all around us. I love Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. Don't do that. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment and according with faith that God has distributed to each of you. I can remember this because it's haunted me for years. I was in high school and I was going on a trip with a bunch of friends. I think we were with the choir group and we were traveling together. We were all driving together and I was sitting in the back seat and had some friends with me there and friends in the front seat. And we started talking and I don't even remember what came up, but an argument came up. And pretty soon, people were becoming, you know, staunch in their position. And I remember, you know, arguing and voices started to raise. And then it just got quiet. And somebody from the front seat said, John, you always have to be right, don't you? You never can be wrong. You always have to win an argument. Then it just got quiet again. That bothered me so bad. It didn't bother me so much they would look at me like that. It bothered me because it was true. I knew it was true. And that hurt. And so I had to have an attitude check. And I continue to have, an, to have this attitude check that am I being humble because arrogance is a huge problem. Do you know people like, like that that have to be right all the time? I also remember I was told that you can win an argument but lose a soul, right? I think I've shared that with you before. You can win an argument, you can be right, but by how you're arguing and by your arrogant attitude, you can drive people away from Christ. And Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, folks, we got to put that aside. We've got to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean this is a doormat theology where you're just supposed to let people walk all over you. I, he's not calling us to that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be ambitious. Ambitious is a godly quality. In fact, look what it says in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So ambition is, is great. I, I like to think I'm an ambitious person, but why am I am an, an ambitious person? As, am I being selfish? Is it a selfish ambition? Not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. What, what if we lived like that? I mean, you just look at those two verses. What if America were to live like this today? Where you're not, it's not all about you, it's not all about vain conceit, selfish ambition. What would it look like at the grocery store? I, I, I was thinking about this the other week and I was standing in line and, you know, I had just a few items and everybody's so nervous about COVID and social distancing and standing in the right place and you're there to get groceries. And so I go up to the line, I have a few items, you know, probably 10 items and the person behind me walks up with one item. And I said, well, you go ahead, please. Go ahead in front of me. So he goes in front of me, and then a few seconds later, a lady walks up. I'm looking. She's got just a couple items. So I'm like, okay, you go ahead. You know, I just stand to the side again. I think three people went by. I'm like, I'm not going to go anywhere, right? <laughs> so at some point, I'm like, okay, I got to just get this. But, but it's that attitude, right, that it's not about you letting other people go first. What if you drove like this? Man, does it seem like people are driving crazy right now or is it just me? It is nuts out there. You know, and, and so it's like when you go to pull over if you're driving, don't put on your blinker in California, right? Why, why not? They're going to speed up so you can't get over. 
That's the attitude. But that is not the attitude of Christ. To let other people shine. To let other people go first. It's not about me. It's not about getting the parking spot and you see that happening and people get out and start fighting because they couldn't get... See, this is, this is not the attitude that Christ followers should have. And one more example I can remember at the dinner table. And we'd all sit around the dinner table and we would actually wait for everybody to get to the table before we started. Do you still practice that? I mean, whatever happened to that? And then we would say the prayer... And we'd have like my favorite biscuits, right? Those croissant biscuits, I loved those. And there'd be a basket of warm biscuits in the middle. And I, I just couldn't wait to get a biscuit, right? But I remember my mom would say, no, you, you offer that basket to your brother first. No, right? It's like me, I want mine. And so selfish ambition and this is not me, I read this, I forget who said this, but I read it this past week. Selfish ambition can be understood as motivation to elevate oneself or to put one's own interests before another's. That's what selfish ambition is. It's self above others. And then it talks a little bit about the Greek term here, has the connotation of contentiousness. I think the King's verse, James Version says strife, this selfish strife or vain conceit. And then this cracked me up when it was talking about vain conceit. It says, uh, self-esteem that has no foundation in reality. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> you ever know anybody? It's like, they got this self-esteem, but it is, it is no foundation. It is not attached to reality at all. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be your attitude if people look at you like that. You know, if we continue to exalt ourselves, God's going to continue to humble us. As we're going to see with Jesus, we continue to humble ourselves. What's God going to do? He is going to exalt us. And so, uh, again, humility leads to unity. And you can't have unity without humility. Look at verse 5 again. In your relationships with one another, have that same mindset as Jesus. It's talking about how we treat one another. And then in verse 6, what does humility look like? What a powerful example, okay? You ever wonder what it looks like to be humble? Look to Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says here. This is so powerful to me. It says, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus was in the very nature of God. He was God in the flesh, but he didn't use that equality to his own advantage. <coughs> Excuse me. So what would that look like? Because I hear a lot about equality today, and, and I'm for equality. Look, look I, I believe that we were created equal by, by God. But is it about you that you're after equality? Are you using equality to your own advantage? Or would you stand for equality because of your love for other people? I have my rights. I have my needs. It's, you know, me, me, me. Okay? But that is not Jesus. He didn't use equality to his own advantage. In fact, Jesus was, think about the life of Jesus. Right? He was, he was born in a manger. The Son of God was born in a manger because there was no room for Jesus in the end. There, there, there was no place for Jesus, so he's born in a barn. That is such a humble beginning. And then you think about the life of Jesus. Isaiah 53 says there was nothing to attract us to him. There was no beauty about him that we, you know, would say, oh, wow, look at him, right? He had no place to call home. Do you realize Jesus had, he didn't have a home like you have a home or I have a home. He just traveled. And then his death. Think about his death. There was no more humiliating way to die than on a cross. In fact, that's why they crucified people. They, they would strip you down naked and they would hang you in front of everybody with nails until you suffocated and couldn't breathe anymore. 
That was the death of Jesus. God in the flesh. He had the very nature of God, but what nature did Jesus take on? He took on the nature of a servant. That's what it says. So, verse 7, Rather, He made Himself nothing, being the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Would you rather be a servant or would you rather be a God? I think everybody wants to be a God, right? They want to be their own God. We want to tell everybody what to do and we want our own servants. We want everybody, serve me, serve me. Do what I say. I'm the authority on this. And yet Jesus chose to be a humble servant. Therefore, that's an important word in your Bible, by the way. Note that. Verse, uh, verse 9, therefore, because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge, will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to God the Father, to the glory of God. So you can bow before the Creator of all that is good and you can worship the Son of God now or later. But the bottom line, everybody's going to bow. And in the end, every tongue is going to confess and see the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I encourage you this morning to humble yourself, give yourself an attitude check, Take on that heart of Jesus, the heart of a servant. A couple quick takeaways. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And, you know, it'd kind of be interesting if you were to ask people, do you know, you know, do I think of myself more highly than I ought to? Do you see me as that person? And if they were honest with you, what would they say? He says, don't have that selfish ambition and be that humble servant. So I found 50 ways to be more humble and to act more humbly, okay? So can I share? No, I'm not going to share them all with you. <laughs> but you can look up online if you want. 50 ways to be more humble, all right? How do we take some of this home? Let me share a few. First of all, recognize your faults. And if you don't recognize your faults, then ask someone close to you. Hey, can you, that you love and respect, can you, where do you see my faults are? That, that's a great way of practicing humility. Admit that you might not be best at everything. You might be best at a few things, but you're certainly not best at everything. And the bottom line is, eventually you're not going to be the best of anything. Okay? That's the way life works. Maybe... Michael Jordan was the best at one time. Maybe LeBron James is the best at one time, but he's not going to be the best forever. So realize humbly, you're not the best. And that's okay, because God values you for who you are. Be grateful and not boastful for what you have. Think about what you have and be grateful for it rather than boastful about it. And when you're wrong, Admit it, and you've heard me share these nine words before. They are powerful words. You were right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. You want to bless your marriage? Learn those nine words and say them and mean them. You were right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Avoid bragging, and while having a conversation, be more considerate of other people by actually listening to them. It's a great way of humility. Rather than thinking of all your bright answers, rather than thinking of all your wonderful responses when you are talking to people, actually just listen to them. That's the considerate thing to do. And finally, learn to appreciate other people for the value that they have. Even if you disagree with them on certain things, there's something you can appreciate and value about everyone. And that's what Jesus did for you. And he did it all the way 
to the cross. I hope you're being blessed by Philippians. I sure am. The more I dig into this, it's absolutely changing my life. And it's challenging me to really work on my attitude this week. Thank you for your patience and thank you for joining us. Let's uh, have another song and then we're going to take communion together.